the morning when I rise, in the morning when I rise, in the morning when I rise, give me Jesus, give me Jesus, give me Welcome once again to the worship services of Heartland Crossroads Cooperative Ministry. We're a United Methodist Cooperative of six small membership town and country churches. I'm Pastor Bob Klingler. I'm joined by my two associates, Pastor Matt Rendulic and Pastor Gary Wade. We welcome you to our service and we have some connections to ministry for you. At Hickernell United Methodist Church, we're going to be doing a hoagie sale. The delivery will be on August 10th and 11th. We need to make the orders by August 4th. There are several options available, Italian, ham, or turkey. They are $5 a piece, and we'll have one of these in each of the churches, or you can contact me by email or text, and we'll be happy to sign you up for your subs. Also coming up on August 1st, on Sunday, August 1st, there will be a uh, cooperative Council meeting. We need to do that to plan our cooperative service that's coming up. So that's on the 1st. That will be at 6 o'clock also at Hickernell, which is a good center point for our co-op. So on the first Sunday in August, August 1st, at 6 o'clock at Hickernell Cooperative Council meeting. Let's see, what else do we have? Oh, coming up on the 15th of August, on that Sunday, is our combined service. It is a picnic and an auction, a white elephant auction. We have a good time. That will be at Harvey Peterson's house on Kiefer Road this year. It will not be at the auction barn as it has in the past. It's at 1030 in the morning. We'll be sending out postcards so you'll get a postcard to see exactly uh, where to go. Behind me you see the quilt we'll be doing with our dollar auction. So remember to bring lots of dollars with you and plan on bidding on the quilt in the dollar auction. It's an absolutely beautiful quilt in fall colors, so we hope that uh, you'll be able to come and take part in that. We'll also be auctioning the, the white elephant things as well. So that's on the 15th. There will be a clothing giveaway at Franklin Center. They're giving away uh, well, uh, clothing that's in good shape, but they have brand new socks and underwear and we pay a great deal for that, so if you'd like to make a contribution toward that, we would certainly appreciate it. And also at Calvary and I Methodist Church, they're doing a backpack giveaway once again with school supplies, and any contribution toward that would be greatly appreciated. You'll find the addresses where you can send offering on our video later on, or you can go to our website, heartlandcrossroadsministry.org. It's all one word, heartlandcrossroadsministry.org. And on there, you also find the lyrics for all the songs for today. So we thank you, and we invite you to come now, and let's worship together. We begin our time of worship today with He Keeps Me Singing. That is why I shout and sing. 
morning psalm is Psalm 71. In you, O Lord, do I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness deliver me and rescue me. Incline your ear to me and save me. Be to me a rock of refuge, a strong fortress to save me, for you are my rock and my fortress. Rescue me, O my God, from the hand of the wicked, from the grasp of the unjust and cruel. For you, O Lord, are my hope, my trust, O Lord, from my youth. Upon you I have learned from my birth. It was you who took me from my mother's womb. My praise is continually for you. I have been an example in many, for you are my strong refuge. My mouth is filled with your praise and with your glory all day. Do not cast me off in the time of old age. Forsake me not when my strength is spent. For my enemies speak concerning me. Those who watch for a life consult together, saying, God has forsaken him. Pursue and seize him, for there is no deliverer. O God, be not far from me. O my God, make haste to help me. Amen. We continue our time of worship with El Shaddai. Technology is part of, of science. It's a thing that lets us use video like this and, and things like computers and, and television and all that, tablets and other things so you can watch me and hear me. <laughs> Technology is grand. It gives us video games and all kind of good stuff. Problem is... Some people think because we got technology, we don't need God anymore. And that's just wrong, because God matters. You see, technology does wonderful things, but not as good as God. God teaches us how to, how to love one another, how to, how to treat people, how to care for people. That matters a lot. It teaches us right from wrong. Technology and, and science can't teach us that teaches us how to be good people and teaches us what matters most and who really cares. And that's 
That's God who really cares about us. God loves us, each and every one. So, and while science is great and we can do lots of cool things with technology, it's G-O-D, God, that matters the most. Because God loves you and God loves me and always will. Technology wears out. Science doesn't have all the answers. God does. God never wears out. And God loves you. So do I. Y'all take care now, okay? Bye. <laughs> As we come to our time of prayer this week, we begin with our concerns. Uh, we've been asked to lift up Tina Zakastalecki's mom and Virgil Smock's sister, and his sister has COVID. She's out in Oklahoma. We also want to keep uh, Michelle Smith in our prayer. This is her second surgery with cancer, so we want to keep her in our prayers. Um, they're removing lymph nodes, and uh, we just want to remember her as she's going through this difficult time. Mm -hmm. Likewise, the Reverend Susanna Metz, um, she's in palliative care uh, and hospice as well, so we want to keep her in our prayers. And the hospice in England is very different than it is here. It's uh, like an acute care. They, they do all sorts of very interesting things. She gets this big bubble bath all the time and a lot of other things. I mean, it's... Mm -hmm. It's very different than what we think of as hospice. It's, it's a really special care. It's pretty neat. Also, if you would uh, continue to pray for Chris Herendeen, having problems with his eye and, of course, the leg that's been ongoing for quite some time. We want to keep the family of Mike Prince in our prayers. He passed away, uh, a relatively young man, and we want to keep him in our prayers. He's connected very deeply to our Conneautville community. Um, so keep them in our prayers as they are grieving. And likewise, there's just a lot of lonely, grieving, and mourning people lately. And we know that God walks with us in those valleys. So we keep all of those people, uh, ourselves included at times, in our prayers. As we come to our time of joys, uh, Sherry had her knee surgery. It was a success. She's at home recovering. And we continue to lift her in prayers there. But we're, we're grateful for a successful surgery. And uh, last week, our Springboro Community Worship was just a wonderful time together. It was so good to have the praise band back together and sing, and all the folks that were there really appreciated it. We had a nice meal together. It was uh, good to be able to get back to that. Here at the Parsonage, Pastor Bob and Julie planted uh, two trees in honor of their grandchildren, Sophie and Harper. Uh, so if you drive by the Parsonage, you'll be able to see that and uh, have that eternal memory as well here. And then likewise, we have another joy that Lisa Sayers, who we've been praying for really for years, I would say, for a couple of years, yeah. right? Um, Absolutely, yeah. She has had a couple of what she calls feel like myself kind of days. And anyone who has been through cancer treatments and has been through a tough life knows just how valuable those days are when you can sit back and breathe and just feel like life is normal. So we're grateful for all of that uh, with uh, Lisa as well. Amen. Remembering all these things, let's come before God in a time of silent prayer. Good morning, God. We just thank you for this beautiful day that you've given to us. You've blessed us in so many ways after all those days of rain, we had some dry days this week, and uh, folks were able to get the grass cut and do some other things, and it's just, uh, it's a blessing day after day in the ways that you care for us and provide for us. As we look around, we see the, the crops that are growing and how they're thriving, and we see the, the beautiful flowers of summer. It's a, it's a beautiful time of year, and we are thankful for that. God, you just find all sorts of different ways to bless us in the, in the people around us, the people who are part of our community that we encounter in, in different places. Maybe it's walking down the street or in a store or a restaurant or at the park. But we are grateful for all those around us if, because if we look closely, we see your image in the eyes of each and every one. God, as we come, we have concerns, and we've lifted up just some of the names, and we know there are so many, many more. 
we give all those needs to you and we just ask that you would reach out your hand and bring that healing and wholeness that only comes from you. God, in this time of, of summer activity, when people are out and about, we ask your traveling mercies, watch over folks. Uh, it's, there's a lot of people out traveling in lots of different ways. We thank you. God, we ask that you would be with your church as we continue to look for new ways to touch the hearts and minds and lives of the people around us, to bring the good news to life in practical ways that help people to see you and then they're willing to hear. So God, guide us and direct us and help us. And we thank you for all of your love and all of your care. In that wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. This morning we continue with our Frequently Asked Questions series and we have the question of in an age of science and technology, why do we need religion? So we turn to the scriptures in Genesis chapter 1, a familiar scripture but listen because the word of the Lord is living and active 
and can transform our hearts even in this hearing right now. The Bible says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth, earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. Then God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. Thus God made the firmament, and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so, and God called the firmament heaven. And so the evening and the morning were the second day. Then God said, Let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters he called seas. And God saw it was good. Then God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seeds, and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself on the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, the herb that yields seeds according to its kind, and the tree that yields fruit, whose seed is in itself according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. So the evening was the morning and were the third day. Then God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and seasons and for the days and years, and let them be for lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so. Then God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. God set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth, and to rule over the day and over the night, and to divide the light from darkness. And God saw that it was good. So the evening and the morning were the fourth day. Then God said, Let the waters abound with an abundance of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the face of the firmament of the heavens. So God created great sea creatures and every living thing that moves, with which the waters abounded according to their kind, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the waters in the sea, and let birds multiply on earth. So the evening and the morning were the fifth day. Then God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature according to its kind, cattle and creeping thing and beast of the earth, each according to its kind. And it was so. And God made the beast of the earth according to its, its kind, cattle according to its kind, and everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, See, I have given you every herb that yields seed which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed, to you it shall be for food. Also to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth, in which there is life, I have given every green herb for food. And it was so. Then God saw everything that he had made, and it indeed was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth and all of the host of them were finished. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work, which God had created and made. 
the word of the Lord for the people of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. As Pastor Bob and Julie will attest, my favorite human being on the entire planet is a um, 90s comedian named Norm MacDonald. And Norm MacDonald wrote a book called, um, it was a memoir of his own life called Norm MacDonald, based on a true story. And at the very beginning of that book, he goes to say about the effects of telling story and memory and how everything affects how we tell a story. In fact, even if Pastor Bob and I spent an afternoon together, we may tell the story of that afternoon incredibly different, mm. even though it was the same exact afternoon. This is something that Norm MacDonald brings about that says, the book may not have facts in it, but it has truth in it. And just like the Bible in many ways, this is a very hard thing for many people, because many of you were raised in traditions like I was, and even within the United Methodist Church, even though that's not the official take of Wesleyan theology, there is an ideology that uh, states that the Bible is 100% true uh, and factual in a literal sense, yeah. even though that is not the official Wesleyan or United Methodist sense of theology or how we study the Bible, which is called hermeneutics. True, but not literal. True, but not True, literal. but not literal, yeah. The Bible contains truth. This creation story kind of shows a lot of that. And there's a divide, and maybe even a divide in our churches, um, within our co-op. And the reality is, science is a discipline that continually asks questions. And because they question, um, you know, things, they um, expose facts. And they are continuously exposing these facts. And according to our latest understanding in science, the creation story doesn't necessarily mesh exactly with how we can observe creation to take place. And you say, well, how can we observe creation to take place? Well, every time you look in the night sky, you're looking into the past. And not like 10 days ago past, but rather you're looking into millions and millions of years past. So as we are observing a star that is blinking out and dying, that has happened tens of millions of years ago. So we can see, you know, almost to the very beginning of the Big Bang with our, um, you know, Hubble Electron Telescope. We can see the um, cosmos, the universe, literally becoming into existence and being able to place that into a measurement with time. And it doesn't match this six-day, 10,000-year-old Bible story that we have. Oddly enough, it does match in the broad strokes. Mm -hmm. You know, like there was nothing, and then there was something, something. And then, you know, a long way down the road, humankind came into existence, and we seem to be on the top of the intelligence of the food chain at this time on Earth. So that seems to make sense within the sure. uh, creation story, although it probably did not happen that God said, snap, here it is, snap, here it is, snap, here it is, snap, here it is. Rather, there were tens of thousands, and if not millions of years between each days in a scientific spot. Now, this can be concerning for Christians because Christians read this and they say, well, if this is not true from the very beginning or if this is not factual from the very beginning, well, then why would I place my salvation, a fact, on a man named Jesus who is God? Or why would I have any theological sense at all about me? And I think that that is also a fair question. I think that, you know, when it comes down to this question of the authority of the Bible, we have to know what the Bible's purpose is versus what we assign it to. To be honest, I think in the late 19th and the early 20th century, Christians became very jaded and mm. um, lazy in the industrial expanse, in the scientific expanse. And then rather than um, embracing a new understanding as more factual evidence became available, they just said, well, whatever the Bible says, the Bible says, and that's it. But that was actually never the purpose of the Bible. When the authors of the Bible wrote their text, and then when it was edited hundreds of times before we even have read it, much had changed. Hmm. For instance, do you really think... And this is not a Da Vinci Code kind of thing, 
But do you really think that out of the hundreds of authors that we would have who wrote the scriptures, even if we, you know, assume that the people that we've named the books after really wrote them, um, and that Moses really wrote the first five books of the Bible, <laughs> do you Which really you think that the number 33 would be so important to everybody that it just naturally shows up? For instance, um, the 33rd time that uh, the name Noah is mentioned is when the rainbow appears in the mm. book of Genesis. And that's where there's hope. Jesus was 33 when he died, and there was hope because of resurrection in that. And there's on and on, more and more of those kind of numerological kinds of things. These are obvious things that um, nerdy people who edit scriptures, um, people like me but lived in caves hundreds of years ago, um, added to make a point and to make uh, a point known and to have things stand out in certain ways. It's not just like natural serendipity that these things happened. Um, you know, and, and even the census of the land, there was actually no historical way possible that when they talk about Israel having, you know, a army of 30,000 people, that the little tribe of Israel could have had that many people at that time on earth because there probably was not that many humans <laughs> on earth. The numbers are not factual. And that's okay to say, and it's okay to admit, because the Bible, like Norm MacDonald's biography, is not meant to be factual. It's meant to be truth. Yeah. And it's meant to lead you in a spiritual way. I hate cute Christian things. I mean, I think I've said this before, but sometimes people will say, and please forgive me if I've ever said this, but I don't think I ever have because I sort of vomited in my mouth when I had said this. But when people say things like Bible, it stands for basic instruction instructions before leaving earth. Like, I mean, I'm actually dry heaving right now saying that, you know, this is not what the Bible is for. The Bible is not to instruct you in that manner. The Bible is meant to connect you with people who have had relationships with God throughout history and to enrich your relationship with God so that you can be a blessing to other people, just like Israel is a blessing to all nations, fulfilled, fulfilled through Jesus Christ our Lord, so that we might jo um, share joint heirship with Jesus and God in that connection. The rest of it, the facts of the Bible, really don't matter. It doesn't matter if David was uh, you know, the second king of Israel or if David ever really existed. We don't have historic proof that a man named Abraham existed. We don't have his driver's license. We don't have a social security card. Um, he may have been No born. death notice. Yeah, you know, exactly. We don't know if Abraham really existed. And it doesn't matter because the Jewish people still came out of somewhere in history and they brought us this message from God. And that's the important part of it all. I kind of laugh when I listen to shows like Dave Ramsey on the radio, and he's using biblical evidence to tell you how to uh, invest in your 401ks and live your future. They never would have dreamed of capitalism, investing in future, or retirement in the Bible. People died in their 40s because they were old and decrepit and had diseases back then, were eaten by bears and shot by <laughs> Romans with arrows and war. They didn't think about 401ks, and the Bible has nothing to do with our wealth or our wealth training today. You might find some Proverbs that talk about saving and understanding and that kind of stuff. And Jesus was actually um, antithetical to um, <laughs> saving. He said, give everything to the poor all the time. And then he said all these parables about how, you know, if you store up things in barns, they just burn away. It's better to store up, you know, godly values, which is giving to charity and helping the poor and all that kind of stuff. The Bible is not what we make it out to be. This basic instruction before leaving earth is, uh, I don't know why I'm mad all of a sudden. I started this out actually rather happy. There's but, actually a good song with that title. Oh, well, well, I don't yeah. I don't like it either. But <laughs> it's, it shouldn't be that way. The Bible teaches us how to cultivate our relationship with God at an internal level so that externally we can be God for the world. And when we pray things like, may your kingdom come on earth and it is in heaven, we finally have that power and that vision. The Bible is not telling you how to manage your checkbook. The Bible is not telling you how to manage your mental health in most ways. The Bible is not telling you um, 
um, just basic things like Ezekiel bread and how to cook ancient grains and make your body healthy and lose weight in the you know Daniel diet or anything like that. That's not the purpose of the Bible. The purpose of the Bible is so that you come face to face with a tortured and crucified Lord who is resurrected in you. Maybe you'll be nicer. In this. It's well. It's the Bible's a book of theology. It's not a history book. It's not a science book. If you ask the wrong questions, you get the wrong answers. It is a, a book of theology. When you look at that Genesis passage and it talks about creation, there are two different accounts: chapter one and chapter two, and the the order of things is different. It's because it wasn't a scientific explanation. It was theological. In that first account. God speaks and things happen because Israel wanted to make the point that their God was stronger than all the other gods. And they literally believed that there were other gods all around in other territories. Mm -hmm. And they were saying the God of Israel merely had to speak because he's more powerful than all other gods and things come into existence. And this is true because versus Zeus who had to fight with older gods so that humankind could come into existence. There or was they no had battle. To, or, yeah, or the, the gods had to wrestle with primordial matter, and it was this yeah. huge titanic struggle to create, where the God of Israel simply spoke. He said, this is it. And through the power of speaking, it came into being. It was a theological statement, is what it was. The Bible's about spirituality. Science asks questions looking for specific factual answers about how things do the bible tells us who mm. and the fact that god spoke it i mean you look at the order of creation it, it fits with the way plants developed on earth and, and then eventually animals that sort of thing but n it was not intended to be a science book people were just trying to explain who did it where did this all come from and what's our relationship with god it's interesting there were Two movies that are kind of parallel to each other, and, and they have some important differences. In 1953, there was one called War of the Worlds. In War of the Worlds, these aliens invade, and scientists come up with this powerful weapon to, to use against the aliens, and the weapon fails. And it looks like utter disaster, and the only thing left for people to do is to pray. And so they pack the churches, and they begin to pray. And after they have gone to church and prayed, and after... Technology has failed, the aliens develop a, an earth bacteria, and they all die. And in the end, it said, you know, everything that man did was useless, and it was this bacteria that, that killed them, and you have people praising God on a hillside. Then you get to the, the new version, which was called Independence Day, and you've got the aliens once again coming to earth and trying to take over. But this time, it's technology that succeeds. It's courage and stamina and human beings that do it. And so you go from this one that talks about trusting in God to, to basically now we're trusting in technology and science. So the question is, do we no longer need God? I mean, that's the, the bottom line. Do we no longer need God? And the answer is yes, because of what the Bible does teach us. The Bible teaches us to love. I mean, that's the big word. The Bible teaches us how we are to live with one another. Science doesn't do that. Science just looks at things in a very factual, structured way. But the Bible teaches us about the kingdom of God, what God envisioned for the kingdom. It gives us this beautiful blueprint for how people are to live together. We live in a world where there is chaos, and God wants to bring shalom out of chaos. And to do that, here are the things that people should be doing with one another. And it's all a matter of loving each other. All the different commands that you find are for our own good. When you go back in those early books, what we call the law, but what the Jews called the teachings, they taught us how to take care of ourselves, how to take care of each other, how to live with one another, and how to begin the work of the kingdom. And then Jesus comes and explicitly outlines the kingdom. And the kingdom is based on loving one another. And that's not a scientific concept. You can't quantify love. You can't prove love. You can't uh, dissect love. You can only love. And Jesus taught us how to love one another. And that was the success 
for the, the disciples. They went out and built a community where they cared for one another, provided for one another, helped one another, did it without asking for anything in return. They accepted those who didn't believe the same way they did, and they welcomed them in. And little by little, they attracted people into the kingdom. We work so hard on going out and dragging people into the kingdom where it's supposed to be an attractional model where we live in such a way that people see it and say, whoa, I want to be a part of that. But when you think about things like uh, morals and ethics, those arose out of religion. Now, there are folks who would say, yeah, non-religious people live very well, but somewhere, somewhere back in time, people were taught in, in their faith journey about these things, and it trickled down to, the, to today. And so people who think that suddenly in a vacuum they invented morals and, and ethics and things are only deluding themselves. It comes out of religion. It was how we are to take care of each other, how we are to treat each other, what is the difference between right and wrong in the world. Those are all concepts that come out of theology and religion. They don't come out of science and technology. Science and technology are wonderful. If we didn't have it, we couldn't be doing this right now. We wouldn't be able to put our online services. We wouldn't have the cameras and things. We wouldn't have the, the television to watch it on or the computer or the tablet or the phone or whatever. And technology gets more amazing all the time. Uh, in some ways, technology makes our lives easier and better. But then again, in some ways, it's made the divide even bigger. You look at social media and some of the things that have gone on there and the anger and the division, a lot of that's fueled by technology. We need religion. We need God because that's the only place that we really learn how to get along with one another. That's the only place where the bottom line, the DNA, is love. Mm. That's what matters most. And science will never teach that. Technology can in some ways enhance it, but it also can work against it. What we really need is God, <laughs> the bottom line. Uh, what the world needs, what was song, what the world needs now is love. What the world needs now is God. And it's from God that love comes. And there we begin to, to make a difference. You look back at that Genesis passage and it uh, talks about caring for creation. Right now we're seeing the consequences of not caring for creation. Mm -hmm. Uh, the terrible fires and the, the heat waves and the floods and so many other things because we haven't done a very good job of caring for creation. Uh, even the diseases that crop up, so many of those come because of the way we have treated the environment and the things we have dumped into water and earth. And There's a dead zone down in the Gulf of Mexico where even the fish can't live. Uh, we're, we're to be responsible for that. The Bible reminds us, science doesn't tell us that, the Bible reminds us of that, that we have a responsibility to care for this created order that God has provided for us. The, the Bible talks about responsibility, talks about spirituality, doesn't talk about history too much, although it's a history of God's interaction with his people, but it's not meant to be a, a, a careful history book or science text. It's a theology book, and we need theology. We need God. We continue our time of worship with God of the Sparrow, God of the Whale. Yeah. Hey. 
brothers and sisters, as we go throughout this week, remember science is there to help us with the physical things, to help understand how things grow, how our bodies works and all that. God and our religion is for our inner person. It helps us explain to us why we know there's a difference between good and bad. It gives us our personalities. It allows us to understand one another. It allows us to love. Love being the most important thing that comes from God that is our spiritual side of us. That is nothing that science or physical things can come from. Only love comes from God and that is why we need religion because God is pure love and that is what he asks us to spread with one another. That is what allows us to get along with one another in life is the love that we have for one another. So remember, as you go throughout this week and you share that love with your family, your friends, and people you do not know, remember, think of the Creator. Think of God because He is the one who lovingly gave that to us to share with one another. Science can't explain it. Only God can. Be blessed in all that you do this week. Amen. In my life, Lord, be glorified, be glorified. In my life, Lord, be glorified today.